Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those I have not had the pleasure to meet, I'm Amy Myers, director of the Yale Center for British Art, and I am delighted to welcome you to the opening events for the past and treasure, Microcosm of the Known World. This extraordinary exhibition has been organized by the Center in partnership with the Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery, part of Norwalk Muse Norfolk Museum Services, with support from the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, the Dr. Lee McCormick Edwards Charitable Foundation, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The magnificent accompanying publication, which I hope you all will have the chance to peruse and read, has been co-published with Yale University Press London and wholly underwritten by the Richard C. Von Hess Foundation through a magnificent gift. We are delighted that the Foundation's president, Thomas Cook, is here with us this evening. The idea for this exhibition was born when Andrew Moore, former keeper of art and senior curator at the Castle Museum, showed me an image of the 17th century painting known as the Paston Treasure on his laptop, rather like the image you're seeing here, but not quite so large. At the time, we were talking over lunch at the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art in London, our sister institution, on whose advisory committee Andrew then served, and he sensed that I might find the work intriguing. He was, of course, right, who would not be fascinated by this splendid, albeit somewhat enigmatic display of naturalia and artificialia, and our conversation launched a remarkable collaborative project with Andrew at its helm. In fact, this project extended our deep commitment to the study of the cultural value of collecting and collections over time through exhibitions and their associated publications and programs, ranging from Mrs. Delaney and her circle and Horace Walpole's Strawberry Hill with, um, I should note, uh, organized uh, collaboratively with the Lewis Walpole Library, through Making History, Antiquaries in Britain, the English Prize, the Capture of the Westmoreland, and most recently, Enlightened Princesses, Caroline, Augusta, Charlotte, and the Shaping of the Modern World. Each of these projects has informed the next, and without doubt, the past and treasure will take our study forward as we shape William Hunter and the anatomy of the modern museum with the University of Glasgow for the fall of 2018 at the Hunterian and the spring of 2019 here at the Yale Center. As curator at Narch Castle Museum, Andrew had undertaken research on the past and treasure for many years, attempting to discern who created this extraordinarily grand but startlingly idiosyncratic depiction of highlights from the renowned collection of the Paston family of Oxnead Hall in East Anglia following the English Civil Wars. And he passed down his lively engagement with the work to his extremely able successor, Francesca Vanti. In a true stroke of serendipity, our own senior conservator of paintings, Jessica David, had focused on the painting for her master's thesis at the Hamilton Carr Institute at the University of Cambridge, then directed by the Yale University Art Gallery's chief conservator, Ian McClure. And with her former mentor, Spike Bucklow, Jessica retained a strong desire to learn more about the complex technical secrets that underlay the painting's creation. Nathan Fliss, our head of exhibitions and publications and assistant curator of 17th century painting, joined the team with incredible excitement over the chance to work on one of the great art historical puzzles from his own period of research, as did, as did Edward Town, our head of collections, information, and access, and assistant curator of early modern art. Indeed, Ed and Jessica were leading the center's um, end of a project with the National Portrait Gallery London, examining both institutions, great collections of early English panel paintings, and the opportunity to extend their work to this unusual masterpiece presented an irresistible challenge. Elizabeth Fairman and Sarah Welcome from our Rare Book of Manuscripts division and Lisa Ford from our research department also came on board. They were joined by close to 40 scholars internationally, including Yale undergraduates and graduate students, current and former, and the sleuthing began 
alongside one of the most extensive and innovative technical analyses of a work of art ever undertaken at that point in time. Three workshops at the Norwich Castle Museum, underwritten in part by the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, brought this global community together to engage in a fully interdisciplinary examination of the many themes the painting suggests. And these rich conversations resulted not only in the exhibition that we open this evening, but the beautiful book edited by Andrew, Nathan, and Francesca, and designed and produced by Miko McGinty, with assistance from Robin Hoffman, Florence Grant, Shawnee Cole, Claire Bidwell, Rita Jules, and our colleagues at Yale University Press. And the exhibition about which you will hear more over the course of this evening's program includes approximately 100 40 splendid objects, not only from Yale collections, including the Art Gallery, Peabody, Beinecke, and of course the Yale Center, but also from close to 50 private and institutional collections across Britain, the continent, and the United States. Without our generous lenders, the exhibition would not have been possible, and to them we extend a huge debt of thanks. We are delighted that many, including Sir Henry and La Lady Mary Paston Bedingfield, are here with us this evening, as are the current owners of Oxnead Hall, David and Beverly Aspinall. We bid them all the very warmest welcome. We owe thanks to every department at the center for enabling this rich and important project to come to fruition, but none have been more dedicated than our teams in exhibitions and publications, advancement and marketing, conservation, registration, and installation. Indeed, we offer our sincere gratitude to Stephen Saidis and Lynn Bell Rose for the exhibition's glorious design. And I must call your attention to Greg Shea's artistry in the exquisite mounts that hold forth so many treasures throughout the galleries. Without Greg's work, the liveliness and um, a uh, sense of recreation of this amazing history of collecting would not really have come to life. A film explaining the technical analysis of the painting has been produced by Culture Shock Media London and has been narrated by Stephen Fry to music composed by Yale senior Griffin Brown, who also is with us this evening. The film can be seen in the exhibition as well as online, where um, the trailer has already received more than 60,000 views, and you will have the treat of seeing it here in the lecture hall tonight um, as it ends our program. There are so many others to whom we owe thanks for the successful execution of this important project, but a deference to time, I now welcome to the podium my esteemed colleague, Nathan Fleece, organizing curator of the past and treasure here at the center who will, opening, who will open this evening's proceedings. Nathan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an immense privilege to be with you all tonight. Echoing Amy, I'm forever indebted uh, to colleagues here at the center, and especially to the teams consisting of those from inside and outside of the center who assembled the exhibition and produced uh, the magnificent publication. I'm deeply, I'm deeply grateful to Ed and Jessica and to our international collaborators, Andrew and Francesca, and to all the lenders and contributors and supporters. I will never be able to repay the colleagues, friends, and family whose support and sacrifices have made this project possible. Remarkable circumstances have led to this moment. Among them, the making, more than three and a half centuries ago, of one of the most unusual paintings you will ever encounter. The survival of that painting against tremendous odds and in recent weeks, the cross-Atlantic voyage made by that painting so that it can be seen in North America for the very first time. Consider the history of the past and treasure, the painting as artifact, its voyage across time. It was completed around 1663 by an unknown artist trained in the Dutch school, working out of a makeshift studio at the Paston's country seat, Oxnead Hall in Norfolk where he had access to treasures that were usually kept under lock and key. It was commissioned by either Sir William Paston, first baronet, a famous traveler and collector who sensed that death was approaching and wished to make a record of his collection before it was divided among his heirs, or by William's son, Robert Paston, a future first Earl of Yarmouth, 
as a way of making his inheritance uh, and, and as, as a way of marking his inheritance and whose obsession with alchemy may have influenced the unusual ingredients it contains. Either way, the timing of the commission hinges upon the death of William on February 22nd, 1663. That's 355 years ago, next Thursday. A commission initiated by William and then inherited unfinished by Robert might explain the dramatic pentimenti or changes in the top right-hand corner, perhaps at Robert's behest. Near the end of the painting process, a large silver dish, perhaps the subject of dispute, was replaced by the mysterious figure of a lady who was in turn replaced by the quiet solution of the diamond-shaped clock. We'll have the opportunity to see images of those pentimenti near the end of the program. It's believed that the passing treasure was displayed at Oxnead Hall for more than 40 years. By the early years of the 18th century, the family fortunes were in steep decline. They'd been on the wane for two generations, ever since the family's estates were sequestered during the Civil War, forcing the Pastons to pay heavy fines, including 1,000 pounds of precious plate, which was used to fund Oliver Cromwell's Army of the Eastern Association. In, 17, in October 1709, there was a sale of the goods at Oxnead. The entire contents of rooms were bought by Captain John Buxton. The bill of Oxnead goods, drawn up by one Mr. Roger Crow, including a large picture that had once hung in the, included a large picture that had once hung in the little parlor. Oxnead was in ruins by the 1740s, but the painting had been rescued. Flash forward more than two centuries to December 1944, the final months of the Second World War. It's difficult to imagine the length of time and change. When a descendant, Mrs. Maud Isabel Buxton of Talkenham Manor, Wiltshire, offered the painting to Norwich Castle Museum. At the time, Buxton wrote, and I quote, the painting is very faded, of no artistic value, only curious from an archeological point of view. I don't want your committee to think it's a treasure. The curatorial committee would wait out the rest of the war before taking possession, as Norwich had been threat, uh, under threat of bombing. The Paston treasure was moved to Norwich uh, by mid to September 1947. Time has ravaged the painting. Photographs taken in 2005 at the Hamilton Carr Institute, after the Paston treasure was cleaned of old repairs and before it was conserved, reveal the extent of damage to the original surface. In addition to the losses now infilled, unconventional paint mixtures, perhaps reacting with exposure to moisture, caused chemical transformations resulting in strange color shifts. Large areas of the painting, most notably the lobster and also the tail of the parrot that you see in this detail, now appear washed out or faded. And no attempt has been made to restore the color losses, so even following conservation, the painting you see today is the shadow of its former self. Coincidentally, the Paston treasure was conceived as a reminder that nothing lasts. The painting is a work of vanitas, referring to the emptiness of worldly possessions and the inevitability of death. It records in fastidious detail a group of 13 heirlooms, all vessels, mostly in the form of mounted shells, five of which survive and are reunited with the painting in the exhibition. The painting foreshadows the fate of these material treasures through its symbolism, the musical instruments that rest unplayed, a song in manuscript about death held by the young lady, a mirror, a recently snuffed out candle, flowers about to wither, fruit ready to spoil, and no less than three timepieces. The glimmering treasures themselves are objects of vanitas. Most were fashioned by emptying the life contents from the delicate shells of sea creatures, such as the nautilus and the turban snail. Death yielding works of art, and in some cases drinking vessels, which embody a natural memento mori, or reminder of death. The message, accentuated by their mounts, which are decorated with molten or flesh-like forms, out of which emerge grotesque faces and fearsome sea monsters, all complemented, of course, in the painting by uh, the auricular frame. Although usually explained away as an element of the luxurious table, the lobster might also be interpreted as a symbol of vanitas. 
The otherwise dark and slimy bottom dweller only reached its most beautiful form in death, a brilliant vermilion. That's to borrow from John Walsh's interpretations of the creature in contemporary Dutch still life. I've remarked upon the distance traveled by the passing treasure recently across the sea and across the centuries. The original conceit of the painting was also about distance. Geographical distance and temporal distance. The past and treasure displays valuable possessions, commodities, curiosities carried from distant parts of the globe. The Nautilus and Turban snail shells from the South Seas, the Strombus or conch shell from the West Indies, the silver and goldsmith's work from Europe, the tobacco from America, the vervet monkey and the gray parrot from Africa. It is as if the world is packed into one picture, an idea underscored by the prominence of a terrestrial globe, which is turned to show the South Seas and part of America. In this context, the young man of African ancestry is cast in the role of caretaker and displayer of treasures from distant lands. Remarkably, the two objects that he holds are among the five that survive. In his right hand, he holds one of the two late 16th century silver gilt flagons, uh, now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in his left, he holds on its side the strombus shell cup with an English enameled mount, which is now at Norwich. The young man who wields these objects is beautifully and distinctively painted suggesting an actual likeness, but it is frustratingly unclear if he was an actual person known to the Pastons or a generic figure based on a studio model. Other historical and generic figures of African heritage appear in similar roles as caretakers of treasures in contemporary Dutch still life. If the young man in the Paston treasure was a member of the Paston household, he was probably a servant and possibly a slave. His real or imaginary burden as caretaker is emphasized by the menacing monkey perched on his shoulder. The young man seems to look back to reproach the creature for knocking over one or more of the vessels, which he now moves to set straight. Surrounded by the treasures and adorned by a rich, almost theatrical costume, the sad reality is that the figure of the young man was probably himself understood by 17th century viewers of the painting as a commodity. Slavery existed in Britain when the past and treasure was painted. In Holland, it was illegal, uh, though it was permitted in overseas colonies and plantations. Britain's role in the African slave trade would only increase and become systematized through government regulations from the 1670s onwards. Robert's, Robert Paston's son, William, the second Earl of Yarmouth, would be directly involved. He invested in a failed expedition to the Guinea coast to look for gold. And in the early 18th century, he was sub-governor of the Royal African Company, which profited from the transatlantic trade in sugar and slaves. Just as the Paston treasure carries the weight, or if you like, illusion of material wealth, so too does it carry the weight of history. The distance of time is captured in the past and treasure, not only through the heirlooms themselves, some of which were upwards of 70 years old when the painting was made. The succeeding generations of the family are also represented by the young lady in the foreground, who is believed to be Margaret Paston, Robert Paston's eldest child, and William's purportedly favorite granddaughter. The music from which Margaret sings has been identified as a setting uh, by the Cambridge-based composer Robert Ramsey of the Caron Dialogue, a traditional duet between Caron, the infernal boatman, and the supplicant, the dead, who is carried by Caron across the river Styx. Through this sung dialogue, Margaret perhaps communes in the painting with an invisible presence, perhaps that of her dying or dead grandfather. After the music was identified during the course of research for the project, a recording was commissioned for the first time of this piece by the Norwich Castle Museum the song can be heard in the exhibition. That the painter or patron wanted us to think about profound distances of time and place is hinted at by the repetition of objects in large and small throughout the painting. Nothing is left to chance in the meticulously planned composition. The life-size monkey and parrot both find their counterparts in miniature on the globe. 
The nautical imagery of the elaborate vessels, the sea monsters in particular, are also found in small on the globe, where they are juxtaposed with ships, putting us in mind of the long treacherous transport of precious rarities. The music book held by Margaret Paston is echoed by the tiny one held by the, one of the two satyrs, which form the stem of the Nautilus cup just behind the globe in the painting. On the actual Nautilus cup, which survives, the music in that miniature songbook is readable. It's also about death and can likewise be heard in the exhibition. The music book held by the satyr is only visible in the painting because of the way the painter positioned the cup. Finally, and disturbingly, the figure of the young man in the painting is tokenized, objectified in small, by the stopper on the shell bottle lying on its side. This takes the form of a so-called Blackamoor's head. This microcosm of the known world, the world as the Pastons and the Paston painters saw it, fills a fictitious space, the construction of which borrows its stock motifs of column, drape, and larder-like table from the repertoire of still life. The artifice or illusion of that space, filled with a mixture of real <coughs> and imagined objects, all suspended in time, seems to make anything in that liminal realm possible. In the interstices of that tight ensemble, we might begin to imagine countless treasures, an infinity of distances, and a legacy that will continue forever. Despite Vanitas, from our present vantage point, it is at first difficult to open up the world in this complex, strange, opaque, perhaps even oppressive composition. But delving beneath the painting's surface with technical analysis and reconstruction, and recovering some semblance of the original splendor of the collection by displaying some of the original objects it contains, the Paston treasure is brought to life. We come to see and understand the place the Pastons occupied in a wide and rapidly changing world and perhaps we come to see ourselves, our own histories, our desires and fears reflected. Thank you. And I, I now invite um, my distinguished colleague, Edward Town, to moderate a panel, a discussion consisting of the rest of the wonderful curatorial team. Please come. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Edward Town. I'm the head of collections information and access um, at the Yale Centre for Art, and also an assistant curator um, for early modern art here. And it's my great honour to introduce our panel this evening, who I've had the privilege of working with for the last three years on this incredible project. For me, uh, they are the past and treasure. Um, they have traveled <laughs> tremendous distances and are each vessels absolutely overfilling with knowledge. Um, because there is so much to say about this picture, um, we're gonna refrain from having questions at the end of this session. Um, the format of uh, what proceeds is that I will ask each of our panelists uh, a question. They will respond after which we're going to um, launch into the film. And then I'm going to invite you all um, to come upstairs onto the second floor into our library court, enjoy a drink, and most importantly, come up to the third floor and see this wonderful exhibition. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce um, first Andrew Moore, um, the former keeper of art and senior curator at the Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery. And we have Andrew to thank for bringing this fabulous project to us at Yale. Um, I also would like to introduce Francesca Vanka, who is the keeper of art and curator of decorative art at Norwich Castle Museum um, and Art Gallery. And finally, um, my dear colleague, Jessica David, who is the senior conservator of paintings at the Yale Center for British Art. But my first question is gonna go to Andrew. And um, this takes the form of a question which is, what was your first encounter with this painting, Andrew? And how's your understanding of it changed over the years? Where do I begin? <laughs> um, that is such a leading question, but it's very pertinent. It's almost followed me um, 
uh, shadowed me throughout my career at Norwich, at least. Um, I first saw this painting in, uh, in the 1980s when I'd been at my post for about a year and this painting, this crate, arrived back from Europe. The exhibition, it had been on show in an exhibition of still life painting uh, traveling in Europe where uh, the museum hoped that it would come to the attention of still life experts and that we might get some answers as to the, the extraordinary uh, nature of this picture um, and indeed the, and who the painter could be. Um, so it was a real surprise to me when it was uncrated. I saw how large it was. It was an immediate problem for me because I couldn't really work out whether this painting should be in the English Paintings Gallery or the Dutch and Flemish Gallery. It was, it's an Anglo-Dutch um, mix of, uh, uh, of genre as well. Uh, it's both uh, a Vanitas painting but also a Memento Mori painting. And it has had something uh, deeply... Uh, personal to the patron hidden within it as far as one could judge. Um, at that time the painting was called the Yarmouth Collection simply because as far as we knew it had been you know, it, it was formally owned by the Pastons and uh, at the time that the collections were dispersed uh, they were dispersed it was thought at that time um, uh, on the death of the second Earl of Yarmouth in 1732. Following uh, recent research, we now know, as Nathan has already um, hinted and said, that uh, it was actually sold uh, to Captain John Buxton, amongst, along with a lot of other uh, treasures from Oxnead, in 1709. We now know also that the Great Drawings Collection was dispersed in the 1690s. So this, this, this uh, collection has, has been dispersed since it was gathered together to be depicted in this way. Um, I, uh, I consulted with experts um, on still life painting to try and nail down the artist. I determined that I would uh, include it in an exhibition on Dutch and Flemish painting. The, the, um, it's, it's, uh, it's importance to uh, taste and collecting in the region in, in East Anglia. Um, it's relevance to that subject, which is... Uh, very important to, to our region in the east of England, uh, the influence of, of Anglo, um, Dutch and Flemish um, culture. Um, another thing that uh, I confess I believed at the time was that the little girl must be uh, a daughter of the house, a daughter of the patron, and uh, it was so uh, clear to everyone, really, that that person must be uh, Mary Paston, who died in 1676 at the age of, of just 12. And this sad event was clearly um, uh, marked by the, by the painting of this picture. That's as it seemed. Because of all the vanitas elements, the guttering candle, the uh, timepieces, etc. Um, now we know rather different that it must be uh, an earlier uh, manifestation um, that... Um, that it's, there's no, no object in that painting which postdates 1665, for example. Um, and um, the hairstyle of the little girl is, is very much rooted in 1662, 63. And we now know, of course, that uh, it's been already been mentioned that um, uh, William Paston, the collector, the principal collector of the family, died in February 1663. So something very serious is going on around 1663, uh, the early years, uh, months of 1663, and, um, and the family events uh, seem to back up the, the art history of this, of this sort of dating. So we now, the, we now know so much, much about that side of the picture, but in, you asked me how my, my ideas have changed. Well, in 2005, I determined to try and get this picture conserved. You've already seen the, 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 the horrifying nature of the, what was underneath this picture, although I have to say there were only um, surface um, uh, problems, really. The substance of the picture is, is, is secure. But um, we raised the money and had the painting conserved by colleagues at Tate Britain and the Hamilton car, and, and at that time Jessica was working uh, with the Hamilton car. And um, there was this astonishing discovery that underneath the clock hanging, the diamond-shaped clock hanging on the right-hand side of the picture, was 
um, uh, a fully painted outline of um, a second lady. And indeed, over her or under her was a large silver dish. And this, this, these are pentimenti. These are more than pentimenti. They are clearly significant changes of mind, uh, either by the patron or the artist. Um, this, the, these discoveries are just a few of those that, that, uh, that intrigued and drove me really to uh, approach Amy, as she's already outlined, to propose the idea of um, a joint project to try to tease out so much more. So I just want to leave you with the idea of the, um, the three aspects of the, of the picture that we hope to unpack uh, through the exhibition, which you'll see tonight. Um, we know so much more about the painting. We know that the, we've got for you to see um, five objects from the painting, that there are uh, depicted in this painting 13 wonderful uh, treasures, rarities, but um, so many of them are missing, but we have got five of them. There's always been, we've always known of four, and we've recently confirmed the fifth. And that, that has been thrilling. We've also identified the music, as, as uh, Nathan mentioned. This has been another thrill, the, the, the whole oral sens sensibility behind this picture, never mind the visual sense of it. Um, uh, so we are proud to name, to name this artist, who we don't know, uh, as the master of the past and treasure. Um, the, the collection, uh, we know so much more about the collection as well, because uh, it's not just 13 objects from the cabinet. The, we, we have discovered a total of 11 inventories of the past and collections, including uh, the jewellery. And from these inventories, we can read that the the closet, the best closet at Oxnead, was filled with, the most, uh, with hundreds of rarities, not just naturalia, but naturalia and artificialia, this wonderful combination that was so um, exotic and, uh, um, uh, and intriguing for the 17th century collector. Highly unusual in an English collection, uh, not even the royal collection features this kind of material in such large measure. So we've no learnt more about the painting, we've learnt more about the collection, and finally we've learnt more about uh, Oxnead Hall. And Ed here has, done, has led m much of the new thinking around um, uh, um, Oxnead. We, we knew that uh, uh, there were new buildings at the time being built at Oxnead in the 1630s by Nicholas Stone at the time of um, uh, William Paston's travels abroad as he he, he gathered his, uh, what is he, on his last shopping trips. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it's become clear that um, the, uh, the so-called um, Friscatine Room, which is a strangely named r room, which was uh, part of the new buildings at Oxnead, was a kind of a grotto-like building that opened out onto the wonderful lawns of the uh, 17th century uh, uh, Italian gardens, and this is a very much a European tradition within the building uh, of Oxnead at this time. It's something new um, and, uh, in, the, in the 1630s. And also, um, we now feel that the new buildings, which are mentioned in the, um, in the inventories, were specifically built, really, for this amazing collection. And so this is all new information which uh, changes our, our understanding entirely, really, of the nature of um, the, what is known as a Kunstkammer collection or a cabinet of rari rarities in, on the, uh, in Europe. But um, it, there is not an equal in uh, England at this time, I would submit. Enough of that. So much more. You'll have to go upstairs. Andrew, thank you so much. My next question goes to Francesca, and um, I'd like to know, after the painting returns to Norwich, um, what's its immediate future? Well, um, as soon as it arrives back in Norwich from here, we'll start installing it, um, along with many of the ob 
other objects on display um, in our exhibition galleries ready for our leg of the show which starts on June the 23rd. Um, our galleries are a very different configuration from yours um, in every way so the appearance of it will be quite different in some ways and we also we don't have all the same objects we have some um, equivalents from different collections um, but we'll be telling the same exciting stories and this painting um, it's always been one of the most popular of our, our entire art collection and it isn't hard to see why um, because it's, it's something you can appreciate on so many different levels I think um, even if you know nothing at all about art or history or the pastons ev ev everything within it is an intriguing talking point um, and children love it and it's always been a central feature of our learning program as well. In fact, uh, they, were, they were going, oh no, it's going to be away for three months, so I've had to do them a full-size reproduction so that, they, <laughs> that, that their uh, classes aren't bereft. Um, a few years ago, we, we even did an entire children's art exhibition based around the themes of the painting, which, which went down very well. Um, the truly miraculous thing, of, of course, about this project, and uh, thanks to all the many collaborators and especially the fantastic team here at YCBA, is how much more we've been able to find out on so many levels and so many different aspects that we didn't even know was there and that will kind of in, in, enrich our understanding for the future. I think that men, means an immense amount long term to the audiences in Norfolk. I mean, everybody, you know, most people in Norfolk are familiar with the names of the past and that they, they may well know the painting from having visited it visited it in the past and of Oxnead Hall is also uh, an, an, a source of interest and excitement but the fact that we've been able to bring so many different themes together and tie up so many loose ends um, is amazing. This picture has also been more known by what is not known about it and the fact of, of its mysteries and even something as simple but miraculous as being able to put all five surviving objects with the picture. I think people will be amazed by that and they'll finally think, goodness, the past and treasure is real. Um, it's, it, it's amazing. Um, similarly, um, in Norfolk, I think it would be of particular interest that a lot of the objects um, from the past and treasures um, may survive, and some definitely do survive, in other stately homes. Um, Oxborough Hall, Felbrigg, Blickling um, are all well-known uh, 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 other stately homes in the county and all of them house treasures which were once from the Pastons. I think that will be of great interest to our Norfolk audiences to kind of link together the history of the Paston treasure, not only with the history of Oxnead but also with the county of Norfolk as a whole, um, which, will, which will be great. Um, once the show is finished uh, in September, um, in the first instance the the um, painting will go back to its uh, previous gallery, um, which was um, a mixed media gallery of fine and decorative art um, entitled Treasure, Trade and the Exotic, um, with the, the broad theme of collecting outside Europe. Um, and um, bringing, bringing the world home. Um, I curated that gallery 10 years ago, um, broadly inspired by the themes of the past and treasure not long after it had come back from its conservation. Um, of course, now we know so much about, so much more than we did, um, really, I ought to take over the entire museum and um, just make it about the past and treasure. But um, I th they might not let me do that. So I, w I might just shift the themes of the gallery slightly to, to focus some more. Um, but finally, all I can say is that um, everybody I've talked to at home about this project so far has been immensely excited by it. And you know, we, I can't wait to share it with our audiences in the summer. That's so nice to hear. Mm. Thank you. My final question, oh, hold, hold your fire, <laughs> because there's one more question, and, and that goes to Jessica, um, whose care of the painting goes back over a decade. So I'm going to pose a similar question to you, Jessica, as I did to Andrew. Um, can you tell us just a little bit more about how and when you first came to work on this picture, and how that experience has shaped your role in this wonderful exhibition project? Sure, of course, thanks. Um, my experience with the past and treasure began in about 2005 when I was a student at the Hamilton Carr Institute and it was there for a conservation treatment. Um, we knew it would be there for a while, it would be a big treatment because as you could see it had a lot of damages in the paint layer, um, but there were other condition issues that made it difficult to read the composition. Um, and I speak specifically of those red and yellow glazes that have faded across the painting and the other passages like the lobster that didn't just 
lose color but converted to this milky, opaque surface. With my then supervisor, Spike Bucklow, we analyzed the paint layer. We took pigment samples to understand which colorants had failed and why they had done so, so dramatically. Um, and we knew at that stage of those uh, extreme uh, refigurings at the right of the composition, but we were more focused on the painting's state of preservation, its presentation at that stage, than its artistic evolution. Many years later, as this exhibition was um, formulating, um, it became clear through our conversations with this wonderful curatorial team that there were a host of new technical questions on the table that we simply didn't resolve the first time. And those were focused on the conditions of the commission, how many artists may have been involved in the painting's making, if there were long pauses in its production, if things got added later, and also if we could identify characteristics in the paint layer that would make it easier to identify a single artist or maybe place it more comfortably within a circle of painters. And we knew that this meant going back to the painting to find new evidence uh, that we hadn't necessarily looked for the first time. Um, this was not without some challenge because Spike and I now live in different countries and the painting is usually on display in Norwich. Uh, so the new research was born out of a hugely generous and collaborative spirit. Francesca and her team had the painting deinstalled so that we could have a new, long look at it and introduce technology that didn't exist 10 years before. So we were met in Norwich by a team of scientists uh, from the University of Catania called the Landis Group, and they brought with them a scanning macro X-ray fluorescence um, instrument to make elemental maps of the painting. And when we did this in the spring of 2016, it was the largest painting to have been scanned using this technology to date. Uh, we were thrilled with the results as we had hoped. Um, we found out new things about the painter's process and about the commission. So, for example, we could see for the first times in these scans that the overpainted plate and the lady were painted using very similar pigment mixtures and application techniques, little brush marks um, to the rest of the painting. But the clock and the stag said that we see today comprise quite different pigments and different application techniques, which suggests by the time that second change was requested, the past in painter had either abandoned ship or um, was just not engaged in the same way anymore. <laughs> um, we knew it was going to be difficult to present this material um, in the exhibition in any succinct way. Uh, so we had the idea of making a film. Um, and the film is a sort of technical journey through the painting. It highlights its making. Um, it is um, included in the exhibition upstairs, but I'm delighted that we're going to watch it together right now. <laughs> okay, okay, now we can clap. <laughs> The Paston Treasure is a painting like no other, made in the third quarter of the 17th century by an unknown artist. It belongs to the genre of still life painting, but its unusual appearance invites questions about how it was made. Why, for example, is the face of the girl so pale? Why is the lobster pink and not red? Why does the composition look more like a collage than a painting. Close inspection of the Paston treasure shows that it was meticulously planned and systematically executed, with each precious object selected for inclusion and carefully studied by the artist. Treasures belonging to the Pastons, a prosperous Norfolk family, were set alongside stock items from the artist's portfolio, such as the fruit, candle, flowers and animals, as evidenced by the parrot, which appears in this other work by the same artist. The choice of symbolic objects in the Paston treasure places it in the vanitas tradition. The painting is a meditation on the fragility of life and the certainty of death. 
every aspect of the painting attests to the artist's experience and skill. His process was swift and adroit, beginning with the most important components of the still life, moving outward to the figures and animals, other objects, and finally, the table, column, and curtain. But something went wrong. The materials in the painting have not retained their original properties. In part, this can be explained by the natural deterioration of the pigments, such as the bright red vermilion on the parrot's tail and the final red and yellow glazes that hold the composition together. The delicate nature of these pigments has resulted in strange shifts between light and shadow. Dazzling yellows have now faded to muted brown, and vibrant reds are now grey. However, there are other oddities which are not so easily explained. X-radiography reveals what lies beneath the surface of the painting, such as this ghostly figure on the right. Who is this woman, and why is her face obscured by a large silver dish? Further analysis is needed if we want to understand these complicated changes. Macro X-ray fluorescent scanning shows the chemical elements that make up the Paston treasure. This helps us to understand the paint mixtures that were used and how the artist applied them. It also uncovers more about those passages that were overpainted or suppressed. In these digital maps derived from the scans, each element is represented by a color. Copper-based pigment azurite is shown here in green, and the vermilion in the parrot's tail is shown in red. A vast array of pigments was identified, many more than a painter at this time would usually have used. We can only speculate why so many changes were made to the composition. Did the silver dish suddenly become an object of dispute, omitted in haste and replaced by a portrait, this in turn deemed unsatisfactory? Did the painter abandon his easel, exasperated by a meddling patron who had foisted his own pigments onto the artist's palette, which, much like Sir Robert Paston's alchemical experiments, were only doomed to fail? These are some of the questions explored in The Paston Treasure, Microcosm of the Known World, an exhibition which examines the history of a family, their house, their collection, and one remarkable painting in which art and science were brought together to spectacular effect.